Thank the Lord for this is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in him. Can we please humble ourselves and we pray? Father, we want to thank you, King of glory, almighty God, everlasting King. We bless your name. Daddy, be thou exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. For all that you do and what you shall continue to do, Father, we say thank you. Father, as we go into your session this afternoon, give us revelation and understanding. We bind and cast at every manifestation of flesh. Holy Spirit, come and teach us. Give us direction. Open our understanding that will not only be hearers of your word, that will be doers of your word and your name will be glorified. Father, take all the glory, take all the honor, take all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. Praise the Lord. We want to thank the Lord for this is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. By the grace of God, our last uh, teaching, we saw how Miriam was singing and teaching the others how to sing and dance, prophetic dancing, prophetic singing. So today we are going to, as we continue with the Exodus chapter 15, we are going to look at the grumblers, the complainers, the murmurers, uh, the children of Israel are grumbling for food and water. These are the basic necessities of life and sustenance. So let us go to the book of Exodus chapter 15. Let's go to Exodus chapter 15 and we are going to read from verse 22 to 24. Exodus chapter 15 from verse 22 to 24. Exodus 15 from verse 22 to 24. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shah, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no food. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So Shah was a vast, rugged, and uh, sparsely populated um, wilderness region in the north part of Sinai. And it had a modern topography, the eastern side of the Suez of the Negev of Israel. And uh, when you look at where this location is, it hits towards the side of, um, towards the border of um, Egypt to Israel when you're going to connect from Eliat. And the past boundary uh, fortifications of the Egyptian territory, that same route you see, that's the same route when you take, there are also the 70 palm trees. Uh, when you're going, you see it from quite a distance. So these ones, they walked in the wilderness for three days and were unable to find water. So they found a water source at Mara, but it was bitter. This source was bitter, and there was a large percentage of dissolved mineral uh, salts in that uh, environment, in that location. So asking for water to drink was not wrong, but the attitude at which they presented asking the water is where the problem now came in. It was like, if you had left us there, look at now, you're taking us, you're leading us, but this is, this, this is the current problem that is at hand. They were, no, the attitude was just wrong. The attitude was arrogant. And it was not a, a polite way of you know, presenting the request. It was more of a blame and then putting uh, Moses on pressure. So when we look at it, this resulted into complaining, grumbling, and murmuring. It, it was what was happening there. It was the pill of cloud that could lead them to this place. And they knew that God was actually the one leading them because it was the pillar directing them where to go. It was not actually Moses saying, we pass here, we go here. It was the pillar of the cloud that was giving them direction, which routes to take, where to settle, where to rest. So instead of asking for water, they complained to Moses. And this was a test for them. This was a number one test for them. So... We too, as these last days believers, of course we look at now currently the economies are tough, economies are tight, things have become more expensive than before. Everything has changed on the more higher side of expense, negativity, a lot of depression, 
a lot of um, sadness, sorrow going on. But the question is, how are you going to approach that situation you have? Is grumbling, is murmuring, is complaining going to solve it? Uh, most times this one happens, the grumbling, the complaining, the murmuring happens most time when a person has bitterness within them, when a person has a life of bitterness. So we must learn to overcome bitterness because this is one of the avenues in which gives this um, the complaining, the grumbling, a landing pad where it can step on, trample, and then begin to manifest, put somebody under pressure. It's the one that causes, you know, attitude. Uh, some people just talk carelessly without thinking, without reasoning. It is bitterness that is normally their problem. And it's not bitterness even caused by the one they are having issues with. It is bitterness from maybe their childhood, as they were growing up, as things were not favorable for them. They felt, why is it others seem to be more favored than them? Instead of them to sit down, analyze the situation, address the matter, analytically find out where could have been the source of the problem, they always want to shift the blame game. And in the process, attitude changes. And this is where many, even in the body of Christ today, many believers are, are stagnant, they are not growing, they are not progressing. And the best they can do, they are blaming their past. The past has no problem. The problem is them, the individuals. There are many things within them they have not addressed, many things they have not dealt with. And they think when they come to the church and whatever they place on the table as a request must be answered instantly, doesn't care, doesn't matter what their, um, how their ways are, whether they are living a straight life, whether they are living an upright life. They don't care about that. All they want is, I want this thing to be done and it should be done. So when they get to a, a place where it's not attended to, they begin to look for who to blame, who to attack. And you see the mystery with life. You can spend years doing the blame game. At the end of the day, you're still the one going to cry. You're still the one going to feel the pain. You're still the one going to face it. So the earlier you come to terms with yourself, with your own situation, you address it, stop pointing fingers at people, stop blaming people, stop doing all sorts of rubbish and face your own situation, there is going to be a drastic change. And this is what Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 says. Hebrews 12 15 says that looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled. A lot of trouble in people's homes, marriages, places of work, even in the church is all as a result of the root of bitterness. For example, somebody can have an issue, things are not going on well in their marriage as they expected, and you know, they've been praying, but they have not addressed bitterness within them. They've not addressed anger. They've not addressed malice. The one they are interceding for is not living a straight life at all. The person is deceptive. The person is not straight. The person is a crook. And then they are coming to stand in the gap for the person for a miracle of what will make the family happy, and yet their intercession is not dealing with the attitude. The intercession is dealing with the want, not with the actual attitude or the character of change. So, beloved, the Bible says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Our Father in heaven is holy. Everything around him is holy. You want something from a holy God. There is no way you're going to live a reckless life doing things, yet you know the truth, you've heard about the teachings, you know what it is to, be, to do something wrong, you know what it means to do something right. You know, but you still do it and fool around, and you think, okay, I'll go and pray and God will do it. My friend, if it was like that, then we would not have issues like fasting and praying. People would not have issues like complaining, things like this. Everything would just work out automatically. We live a compromised life and want the Holy Father to provide. Then if it was that simple, then there was no need for us to go through all the spiritual exercises we ought to go to. But when the scripture says that Christ is coming for a church that is spotless, blameless, that has no blemish, clean, pure, Beloved, that is enough to tell us we need to put ourselves on check. We need to put ourselves on check. And this is the best time now where the prophets are going to make money. 
They will not tell the people the truth to turn away from their ways. Of course, we are talking about the false prophets. They will not tell people to turn away from their wrong ways. They will not tell them to live a holy and righteous life. They will camouflage and bring a message that the people want to hear. Many times the messages that we want to hear are not the ones that are building us. They are the ones that continue to either pamper us or batter us or cover us up to continue in doing the thing that we know before the Father is not right, but because it makes us feel happy, it makes us feel comfortable, it doesn't condemn us, it doesn't uh, push us to a corner whereby we have to drop some things of this world and take on into the things of God. We always want things our way, our own way. And the Bible tells us in James chapter 4, verse 1, because you want it our way, this is where the troubles come in. This is where conflicts come in. This is where disagreements come in. So that is the major problem. So these people that Moses was leading, they had bitterness in them because of what they went through when they were in Egypt, how the Pharaoh treated them, the tortures and hard work that they were taken through. And here is a group of people that... We are told that the covenant of God is with them and God is with them. But of course, they were complaining, if he's with us, why do we have to go through this pain? Many people, even today, are angry with God. They are bitter with God. They don't want to hear anything about God of our Lord Jesus Christ because they feel their suffering has to do with God. That if he's a God and up in heaven in the throne, why must he allow them to go through what they are going through? Why must he allow them to go through such pain? If he's God and he's seeing, why didn't he come to their rescue before it happened? But you see, they are not looking at themselves praying to God the Father. Why are they angry with him? Because they have never understood Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. They did not read the scripture. They assumed, okay, God is the creator of heaven and earth. He's the creator of man. He's my overall father. He sits up on the throne. He's the owner of the universe. He's not supposed to allow me to go through pain. But we should know from Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, when God says, I've given man dominion over the earth, over the sea, over everything. He gave power of attorney to man to continue to run the affairs of the earth. So as long as we are on earth, for us to have anything from God, we have to pray. When we pray to him, he now answers. And how does he answer? Still through people. He comes in through people, answers through people. So when the attitude is wrong, you could have answered the one God has sent to help you. And because you expected a supernatural God to appear him as God in his sovereignty, to come direct to meet you, and which cannot be possible in that way, you could have lost your helper that God sent. You could have cut off the same thing that was supposed to answer that sorrow just because of attitude. And when we look at this attitude, it comes as a result of what? Root of bitterness that is within one, within a person. Bitterness is formed when people get hurt. Bitterness breeds anger. Bitterness breeds unforgiveness. Bitterness breeds resentment. And in this process, salvation can be lost. There are cases of people who just don't like people. They just hate a person because maybe the person is doing better than them. Maybe the person has a presentation better than them. And you see, in life, we are never the same and we can never be the same. Even who children who are born from the same father, same mother are not the same. They came from the same womb of the mother, but they are not the same. Why aren't they the same? Because everyone has got their purpose to face. Everyone has got a destiny to face. So the earlier we understand that, the better. So many are angry with God, bitter with God. You are killing yourself slowly. You are destroying yourself slowly. It is you who is hurt. Our father is still on the throne, seated up there on the throne. Whether you're angry with him or not, it is not going to change his position. It's not going to change anything. But you getting angry, it is going to change your life. It's going to change, and more in the negative, it's going to change your health. You're going to get pressure. Before you know it, you're getting diabetes. Before you know it, you're getting all sorts of things you're not supposed to get because you are breeding bitterness on the wrong people, on the wrong person. How do you get angry with God? How? So you see, life has 
twisted very many people, all because of what? Bitterness. They have been hurt. Many in the time invested so much in the flesh. What do I mean? They put a lot of money in the lives of people who cut them off. When they needed these people, the people were not there. So in the process, they got pain. They got hurt. And that is where bitterness got rooted up from. And beloved, that is something people need or we need to keep checking and address. It has limited many people, cut off many people from their breakthroughs, disorganized very many people's ministries, marriages, even raising their own children is a problem because they are full of bitterness and this thing is spreading, moving from them to the children and from the children to the society where the children go to, the schools where the children are, the churches where the children go to. And this is why we are having a terrible, disorganized society all rooted from bitterness. Exodus 15 verse 25. Exodus 15 25. Uh, all the versions we are reading are from the New King James Version. Exodus 15, 25. So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. So he cried to the Lord. How many times? He cried to the Lord five times. And when you look at crying to the Lord five times, we see this in Exodus chapter 8, verse 12. He cried unto the Lord. In Exodus 14, 10, he cried unto the Lord. Exodus 15, 25, he cried unto the Lord. In Exodus 17, verse 4, he cried unto the Lord. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 13, he cried unto the Lord. So a pattern of Moses' life shows us that his dependence was on God. There was nothing he did without inquiring from God. He has similar, uh, similar patterns like David. David did not do anything without inquiring from the Lord. So this shod, uh, when you look at the Hebrew word of shod, it means yara. And yara means to point out, meaning as if by aiming a finger like pointing. So meaning as there were many trees, God pointed and told prophet Moses, that tree, yara, showed him, yara pointed that particular tree. And that tree, uh, when you look at it, it's from its firmness, uh, the wood. Uh, when you look at the Hebrew translation of the word tree, it's eights, E-T-S, eights, which is a tree which is uh, holding very firm. Uh, that is now referring more to the wood that is coming out from that tree. So when you look at many Bible translations, it says it, it, it was a piece of wood, meaning that they could have cut a buck from the tree, piece of wood, and dropped it on the water. But how could a piece of wood eliminate mineral salts from a large pool of water? So, beloved, those are miracles and things that happen. But also when the, anyone who knows the Moringa plant, the Moringa plant is also called a miracle plant. And no matter when the water is dirty or it's infected, you just break that Moringa tree, the leaves, and then you drop it into the water. For some time, you notice that even if the water is a bit dirty, it will clear. And it also has a lot of things to do killing some of the bacteria in. But you see, all these things, because they say are good, we have to take them moderately. Some people, because they hear this one is very good, they want to take it to the extreme. You have to do everything moderately, moderately. So it takes obedience. It takes obedience to step out in faith, to act out for the miracle to manifest. Moses was obedient and uh, he was quite sensitive, very sensitive, because he had the voice of the Lord. And he operated more because his dependence was on God. There was nothing he could do when God was not involved. So he tested them. And what was the test? The major test here was what? Obedience. So, beloved, even us in these last days, one of the tests that we are going to go through is the test of obedience. We are going to go through that test of obedience. So what message do we have for the last days? The last days believer is such miracles will be common when drinking water sources will be poisoned. When you read that in Revelations chapter 8 verse 10, let's go to Revelations 8 10. Revelations chapter 8 verse 10. Revelations chapter 8 
and we are reading verse 10. Um, Revelations chapter 8, verse 10. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Uh, when you look at it now, it's talking about some things that are going to happen. And we are seeing some of the natural disasters going on in the different countries, in our different nations. A time is coming when there's going to be some things, maybe it could be like, I will not say it's a nuclear war or something, but it is going to affect the waters because it now falling. It says, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And when you look at that, it shows that there's going to be a time when the waters will be polluted. So how are we going to survive at that time? We will need a miracle like this for God to come in and intervene. But how are you going to hear the voice of God speak when you have not trained your faculties to hear his voice? You have not trained your faculties to hear him speak. The mind is so busy. The conscience has been... Uh, shut down, has been cut off. There is no communication with God. So at that point, how are you going to tell that here there is a message coming or God is speaking if we do not train and come out from a busy, very busy schedule? Our spirit man must not get into a state that it we cannot sense or pick up what message it's giving. It's quite dangerous for us because at that time we will miss the message that God is giving us. So Elisha threw salt into the poisoned water and made them drinkable. When you look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19 to 22, in Jericho well, there was a problem in the land. People were taking water from that source of Jericho. The women, when they would drink of that water, they would become barren. Uh, whatever they would plant, nothing would come out. So now the people were concerned. And you know, one man came and said he was building and um, he lost his last son to this, the, the gate, and then he lost his first son to the foundation because that was the mandate stated by Joshua in Joshua chapter 6 from verse 26 uh, when uh, the children of Israel were being led from Egypt and Joshua took over to continue with the journey that Moses had started. And when the men of Jericho saw that they were approaching their place, they built the walls very fast to, present, to prevent them from passing through Jericho. So by the time they got to that spot from the Egypt side coming into the Jericho side, getting into uh, the Canaan where they were supposed to go, they found that the men of the city had built a wall. And now when you look at it actually in terms of construction, when the wall was built, it was actually not fully dry. When you look at it into the deep analysis. So Joshua, hearing from God, the God told him to keep quiet and move around the building seven times. Now you can imagine a force of thousands of people moving around a building seven times. And it is not so solidly uh, firm. It has just been built. It's not so strong. It has not uh, the strength. It has not spent days where the, maybe the cement or whatever they used has set enough to make it firm. So you can imagine the pressure moving around seven times, not saying anything. Then again, another seven times shouting hallelujah. The walls came down. And the Bible says when the walls came down, of course, with their walking movement, the presence of God was with them. The shouting hallelujah, it was the power of God through their voices and shout that went through in a supernatural way. And the walls of Jericho went down. That was when Joshua made a decree and stated, Beloved Joshua, carried the mantle of prophet Moses. So meaning he was operating in the prophetic. So he spoke the word, he decreed, he made a decree. And beloved, that decree stood. It had to take another prophet of his level of mantle to counter it. Beloved, when parental curses are issues, issued, uh, those who have, who have taken us up like guardians in a parental, when they issue curses, it's just not anybody that can go and reverse the curse. Beloved, there are certain laws in the spiritual realm. There are some spiritual laws in the realm that counter that, break that. So Elisha coming in, he took the mantle from Elijah. 
And when you look at Prophet Moses and Prophet Elijah, you see there are some similarities of mantles around them. The office of operation is quite about the same level. And the time at which they operated was about that same time. And both of them have a big role to play. The spirit that operates in them has a big role to play even in these last days. And that's why Revelations 11, 5 from verse 5 brings out the qualities and the features of the person of Moses and Elijah. That spirit will come out. So Elisha had to get salt for him, for Elisha. The spirit of the Lord led him for salt. For Moses, it was the tree. It was a pointing to the tree to change the bitter waters to make them sweet. Uh, for Elisha, it was salt to, to dissolve the poisoned waters that the barrenness in the land and the premature death may come to an end. Every prophet is led according to how the environment is and how the spirit of the Lord chooses to lead. What worked out for that one prophet for another may not work out for you the same way. That's why it's important that every stage, every case hears from God. The spirit of the Lord is the one leading. So spiritually, what lesson are we picking from here spiritually? How to overcome bitterness. We have to learn how to overcome bitterness from the heart. You forgive from the heart. It starts from within the heart. You begin to get let break loose from the heart, the mind, the imagination. It begins to start. You pick that person that you're bitter with and they begin to analyze where did I start from, from getting angry with this person? Where did the problem start from? Where are they actually the problem or am I the problem? You start it with your thought. You take it to your imagination, into that heart. Why are you holding the person in the heart? Each time they mention the name of the person, you feel pain. You feel grieved. Is it because I was disciplined and I felt I wanted to do it my way and they didn't want me to do it my way? So that's why I'm angry and bitter with them. They then you begin to ask yourself, is there really an actual cause for me to get bitter with such a person? And then you keep asking yourself, why am I bitter with such a person? At the end of the day, what have I achieved from the time I was bitter with that person? That could help you to relieve you and come out, of course, with the Holy Spirit and prayer. Asking the Holy Spirit, melt my heart. Take away every stone of bitterness that is dwelling within my heart, that has become part of me. Then the Holy Spirit will begin to work in you, begin to work in you. So to truly forgive from the heart is to remember no more. You forget, you remember no more. Of course, there's an addend that says you can forgive but not forget. And that's why some people forgive. They've not forgotten. And if prayer was not involved during that process of the forgiveness, you find that when they remember, the bitterness now begins to come back again. It shows they actually did not let go. And some say that I forgive, I forgive. But when they mention, they begin to cry. It shows there's still some bitterness that is there. Exodus 15 verse 26. Exodus 15 26. And said... If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. This is the message now from God. He says, I will put none of the diseases on which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. You, meaning that God, our Father, being a covenant keeping God, and He's a God who is always there by the children that He has made a covenant with, He's trying to give us a message here that He will not allow the disease. The Egyptians here are representing the people of the world, the systems of the world. He is not going to allow the diseases that attack the people of the world to attack with his children, but we must have qualities for us to be in position to do that. We must live a holy and righteous life for us to be that, to, not to get the diseases of the Egyptians. Our hands must be clean. We must live a pure life. We must strive so much not to do things of the flesh. We must draw closer to him. We must bound our heart to him. We must make sure that anything about self goes down that he takes over. 
everything that is contrary down. This is where now Apostle Paul tells us that I have been crucified with Christ. I am no longer living the life I used to live, or it is no longer I, I am no longer the one who lives, but Christ lives in me. That the life that I live in the flesh, I live it in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we work, that should be a goal, our goal. I have been crucified with Christ. That is our target. When we get to that stage, the diseases of the Egyptians shall not come to us because God is a covenant-keeping God. Does he say he will do it and he will not do it? He's not a man that he should lie. So this is the statute and ordinance God made for the Israelites and we, as we read in verse 25. So if we walk in obedience and we are loyal to God, we are sure of his divine protection. We cannot use any shortcut. It is clear. It is straight. No shortcut, no dodging. God reveals himself as the healer. And his name as the healer is what? Jehovah Rapha. He heals us as our healer. So the best translation for this verse is, any illness I brought on the Egyptians, I will not bring it on you, for I am Yahweh, your doctor. So, beloved, God being our physician, he's telling us the illnesses that come upon the Egyptians, he will not allow it to come to us. So we have to be obedient. We have to take away all those things that will not allow his presence to be around us. Like we keep saying, we have one common enemy. We, the church, one common enemy is the devil. So when you spend time now fighting another person in the church, number one, it shows you're not focused. Number two, it shows you don't know, you've not even discovered who you, who you are. You don't know your purpose. Number three, it shows you are confused. Because if each one of us got to know our purpose, and we first our purpose to fulfill it on this earth, you will not have time to waste eh? on destroying another, pulling down another. The problem in the church is many have not discovered who they are. They don't know who they are. They want to assume because the other one is striving high, I must pull them down so that I take over their position. Is your calling the same? Is your purpose the same? Have you been given the same task and assignment? God is not a man that he will confuse things and give 10 people in the same room the same thing. What is the whole thing? He will give us my assignment and attach people with me who will work with me whose assignments are similar to my assignment. We are working together to achieve one goal. At the end of the day, it must be glory to him for his kingdom to be established here on earth. So whatever we do, obedience is crucial for us to be in position to enjoy God's divine protection. And then when you look at it, divine healing is, the, is in the atonement. Divine healing is in the atonement. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24, it says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree? that we having died to sins may live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. So, beloved, we are healed by his stripes. It's not saying by whose stripes you were healed. Past tense, it is done. So all we need to do is call on the blood. But for you to call on the blood, obedience, you must have faith, you must believe. Um, very many sicknesses of late, even doctors are discovering some sicknesses. Uh, no matter the medication people are taking, are not clearing off because some of them have bitterness, anger, malice, strife. So doctors are even telling people to relax and let go. They have discovered that, oh, there is a big connection between the inner man and then the outward healing process of the body. So divine healing can take place, but why is it many are not receiving the divine healing, yet they call the blood of Jesus, they drink the blood of Jesus, they swallow the blood of Jesus, they swim in the blood of Jesus, but there's no healing taking place? Check yourself. There's a lot that is within. There is a complaint within themselves. They are grumbling within themselves. They are murmuring within themselves. 
and there is no way God operates in such a terrain. Exodus 15.27. Exodus 15.27. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. They camped there by the waters. So 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. This is very significant. So number 12 stands for authority, governance. And Elim believed um, the Wadi Garandel or a riverbed in shore that has plenty of water and trees in certain places. So the 12 wells of water are connected to 12 of which also stands for the kingdom of God, which also represents authority. And then the water here, we are looking at eternal life. In the Gospel of John chapter 4 verse 14, the Gospel of John chapter 4 verse 14, uh, the Bible says, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So when you seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, Jesus will give you the everlasting water where you quest will be fulfilled. You thirst no more. So in the last days, what lesson do we have to learn from here? That the rivers of water flows from the throne of God. This is what Revelations 22 verse 1 says. So here are the 70 palm trees produces fruit, produces oil, and what to drink. And when we look at the palm fruit, uh, because it is 70 palm trees, meaning the palm tree has got palm fruit. And uh, this palm tree produces fruits, it produces oil, it produces the juices to drink. And this palm tree has anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. And one of these palm trees is the acai berry. The acai berry is uh, quite expensive here in um, Uganda. It's quite expensive, but it's a certain berry they get from the palm tree. It's purple in color, very medicinal very 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 good so this fruit pulp helps to cure also skin inflammations uh, skin inflammations those people who have breakout skin disease skin rash you try to treat that you treat this you treat that you treat that it shows that the body has been inflamed and at times when toxins are coming out of the body at times they come out from the skin so the best way to do it is flush from within detox from within clean from within this uh palm tree this palm fruit is also used to treat nausea and vomiting. It's used to treat nausea and vomiting as well as worm infestation. You know, worms, we normally have to deworm ourselves, mostly those who eat um, the meat, the muchomo. You have to keep deworming yourself because, uh, for example, pork, there is no heat that destroys that worm in the pork. No matter how you heat it up, Research has discovered that there is no heat. That's why maybe it could have been a reason why God said we should not eat. The pig eats. The design of the pig was to clean up the environment. That's why the pig can eat anything dirty in the environment. So no matter how clean you scrub that pig, the Bible says we're not supposed to eat it. So when you look at, you know, the science of late, why they are discovering some diseases that are affecting people's intestines. It is all connected to mostly those people that have to do with muchomo, uh, meaning the pork that they were eating so much. So this worm infestation, the worming, but now one who keeps staying this acai berry, there is normally a flush out, a clean up. Uh, it is also used an ex as an expectorant and also as a liver tonic. As a liver tonic, people that have got fatty liver advise to keep taking this acai berry drink. But you see most of the ones we see in the supermarkets, unless maybe you're getting it from a, a healthy shop where they are selling 100% organic. But at times the ones you see, you see uh, maybe acai berry. And when you read the ingredients, you find acai berry could be just like 2% or 5%. The other pa biggest percentage is the color, the sugar, the sweetener. But when you get the real one 100%, it's quite pricey, 
But these are things that if you have money, instead of spending fun, saying you're going to the bar to relax yourself, get such things and detox the body. Very good for the entire body system, the liver. The palm drink here, they can make wine. They were making wine out of it. And a moderate consumption of the fresh palm wine is enough to bless the body with the right amount of vitamin B2. Vitamin B2 is very good for the body. Some of the deficiencies we see that are affecting the sight, affecting the entire body structures, have to, a lot to do with the deficiencies of these vitamins. Then the pine wine also contains the antioxidant, which is also rich in vitamin C, which maintains good eye health. Now, like we are reading this Bible, reading your phone, using the laptop so much, your intake of vitamin C has to be so high for the good eye health. Otherwise, you're draining so much, you're straining so much. Remember, each time you look into the laptop, of course, if you've not put anti-glare, even though you've put the anti-glare on the laptop, you have to drink a lot of water and also the juices, the fluids that are rich in vitamin C to, to maintain your eye health and make your eye health strong. Otherwise, a time comes when you try to read the Bible, your eyes start tearing, you're not taking in enough water, you're not eating, taking in enough vitamin C, the eating is poor, you're just full of starch, or what you're eating is full of starch. When you're reading the Bible, you'll not see the letters clear. What are you going to say? They have fired me, arrow. Then you go into prayer and fasting. You begin to hold the eye. Evil arrow fired into my eye, I'll jump out back to send. And not everything is demonic. Not everything is arrow. You need to also feed the body with the right nutrition it needs for it to balance and also perform well for you. So that you also live a holy and righteous, so that you can walk your life of salvation very well. And so that you're in position to do some things without compromise, without uh, using the blame game. But we have blamed Satan, we have blamed witchcraft, foundation, and yet the eating is wrong. What is going to build the body is food. The food you eat. So you eat wrongly, it will give you a wrong result and it will affect your spiritual walk. There is no way you're going to have a sick body and you're going to go on proper spiritual assignments. It cannot work out. You're feeling dizzy every time. You're not going to stand for long. You're feeling dizzy and weak. There's no way you're going to sustain prayer. If you say, I'm going to pray for one hour and you're having body weakness, your eyes are aching, you have a pounding headache, you're not going to sustain prayer even for 10 minutes. What are you going to do that? Ah, Whenever I want to embark on a prayer, Satan rises up. Satan is attacking me. Go and feed your body with the night right nutrition. Balance that body. Some people say in the night, when it is time for me to rise up and pray, their legs are hot. I feel heat under my feet. They have to get a basin of water. They now do the whole night, Holy Ghost fire, the witchcraft power attacking me. Yes, there are those that witchcraft will attack, but majority, their body is full of toxins and poisons eating too much starch, too much sugar. How do you, you're above 30, you're taking much sugar. These are the things that will affect you. So by the time it is night and you want to pray, do vigil, go on a program, the body will tell you, no, it is time for things to come out and you're not addressing, let me put discomfort. So when you look at these 70 palm trees, all these are significant. What are they teaching us? That as there is the spiritual we also have the health aspect to address when the two come together. Remember, Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, God is coming for complete the spirit, the soul, and the body. So you're eating wrongly. Don't expect to have good success in your spiritual journey. They all work together. So when we look at also this palm wine, uh, the palm wine also contains the vitamin B1. This is the thermide vitamin. It improves on the vision. It improves on the vision. So all these are very important for us to be in position to address. So spiritually, what does the palm tree represent? The palm tree spiritually represents, I've told you about the health bit of the palm tree. So now the spiritual thing it represents victory it represents uprightness it represents righteousness living upright holiness righteousness victory that's what it represents when we go back to our early church father uh 
Oregon, he calls the palm a symbol of victory in that war waged by the spirit against the flesh. He calls it victory. So representations of the palm trees featured strongly in the early Christian church. It was an art normally used to symbolize spiritual triumph and heaven. And that's why when you go to the early church, you find they have symbols of the palm trees. They put the symbols of the palm trees significant to show they triumphed and they have victory. So the palm trees can flex and withstand the battering of serious storms. When there are storms in a place and the palm trees are all gone in that same, they can withstand. So what is it teaching us spiritually? That you can withstand persecutions no matter how severe they are if your roots are deep in the Lord. If your roots are deep in the Lord, you are in position to withstand any form of persecution and beloved we need to work towards this because the persecution of the church is not far from now it is getting closer and closer and closer and the third thing is many children of God are not ready but the persecution against the church globally is getting closer we are the generation that will see it or we are more closer to it than ever before when we read uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Ephesians 6, verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We have to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, when we go back to um, Albert Burns, uh, he was a Bible commentator in the 19th century. Albert Burns uh, tells us that the righteous likened to a palm is rough to the tough and in a manner enveloped in dry bark but above it is adorned with fruit you know fair even to the eye below it's compressed by the enfoldings of its bark above and it is spread not in an amplitude of beautiful greenness so this is how albert burns describes the palm tree and brings it out in a way, he's try, what is he trying to bring out? The persecutions, the trials, the testings, the rejections makes a believer to be strong. That is how he translated the Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 through his uh, commentation. So what's the mystery behind Elim? Uh, the Hebrew word of Elim is Elim and it means palm trees, a place in the desert. And it also represents the strength, stands for something strong, and a chief, an oak, or the other strong tree. So when an end-time leader is strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, he becomes a well of water to water other people's thirst. And he will draw water from within him to feed others with spiritual wisdom. And he also becomes a palm tree to nourish the hungry with spiritual knowledge. That's why we, the leaders, spiritual leaders in the church, we have work to do. We have to work on ourselves. We have to draw close to God. We have to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We have to work day and night to build an intimate relationship with him so that we don't miss out that when he waters us, we are in position to water the congregation with the right information, the right food they are supposed to take to nourish them, to make them grow, to make them pick up. Otherwise, it will be catastrophe. What message is it for the last days? The woman, Israel, the church, is brought to a place prepared by God where she is protected and nourished. Here, what does it mean? The food and water prepared for her. Revelations chapter 12, verse 14. She's taken her in a place where she's nourished for a time. Time and half a time, three and a half years of that period. So the Jews here use the palm tree, the palm leaves, to welcome Jesus when he came to Jerusalem. We read that in the Gospel of John chapter 12, verse 13. So the palm tree is one of the seven species in the promised land, according to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 8. So the seven species of food that God assured his people that they would find in the promised land 
What were the foods mentioned? They were mentioned in the Bible. It was barley, wheat, grapes, honey, figs, pomegranates, and olives. So honey is from the dates. And actually, when you go to Israel, the syrup, uh, the date syrup, there's that syrup in a yellow bottle. You see that the date syrup. The honey is the date syrup that comes from the palm trees. And from the palm, they get the dates, and then they squeeze it into honey. Then there's the dates that you can eat that has the seed in it. Very healthy and very medicinal. Good for the brain, good for the immunity, rich in vitamin C. Very, very, very good for the brain, organ, the sight, and also the immunity. And uh, this syrup comes from the palm trees, making palms one of the seven species of promise. So what does it signify? There is no lack in the kingdom of God. Of course, most of the wheat we see now in the market has been changed. But the wheat that even the Bible talks about, there are some scriptures you read, spelled flour. That spelled flour is the original wheat we are supposed to be eating. The ancient wheat it's called spelt flour. Thank God it's in the market, but quite pricey. That one is very rich and high in fiber. It is the one that we are supposed to use when we are baking our bread, making our chapatis, making our cakes, anything that has to do with baking. It's that spelt flour we are supposed to use. Most of the wheat we see in the market is having issues. That's why many people who are eating wheat, who are eating wheat of late, are getting into diabetes. They're having di they are getting diabetic because we don't have now the right. It has been changed a lot. A lot has been changed. But the original one, even there are scriptures that talk about the spelt fly. It's talking about that ancient, ancient wheat that was written in scripture. So there is no lack in the kingdom of God. There is an abundance of true richness in all things. And this is what Revelation chapter 7 from verse 16 to 17 says. Shortage of food is another test for the children of Israel. They were tested through food. And beloved, even us here in our days now, food is a serious matter. There are people who can go through tough spiritual tasks and assignment. When the devil wants to play them and he's realized they have not disciplined that aspect of food. Beloved, for you to be in position... To control yourself, it is a discipline. And it is something you train your faculty of the mouth. You train your body. And the best way to do this is living a fasted life. Living a fasted life, you can decide to break your fast at midday. You can decide to have a meal a day. You can decide to have a routine where you're doing fruiting and juicing and eat one meal later in the evening, you can choose it your way. Like some people who are treating high blood pressure, they are advised to have the breakfast more than the dinner and the lunch. So if you are the type who is going through such kind of medication, you can have your breakfast, your heavy breakfast, then during the day, lunch, evening, it's just water. Fasted life, you have a routine, not having breakfast, lunch, evening, tea, dinner, four meals a day, uh-uh. When is the body, you know, going to have a rest? Even at times, the body needs to have rest from food. So, the children of Israel, we are tested through food. Even as a time will come, we shall be tested. But those who are in the Lord, they will never lack. They will not go wanting. They will not go stranded. God will take care of us. No matter what, he takes care of his own. So all this, when you look at it, it is a journey of paying the price. You just don't jump from here and jump to the other high height like one who has paid the price. You can never be the same. Even people that I see people fighting, some men of God, women of God, somebody has worked. They have gone through the price. They have gone through, they paid the price. They have gone through the stages of hard pain, difficulty, and God has lifted them up. Now somebody wakes up today, goes to that man and woman of God, places their request, wants them to take care of their whole family, their whole generation, clear all their problems within one day. It is impossible. So when that one tells them, go and do the task, they say that one is bad, the person is wicked, the person is this, go and pay the price for you to be in position to value 
what the heavens has released for you. Not everything is going to be on a silver plate. Every one of us has to go through that journey. But because people are lazy and people want things already made and done, but I've come to understand and realize the more I keep studying this Bible, there is nothing for free. The more I keep studying this Bible, there is nothing you can just get without you getting close to God. And that's why many have taken the shortcut route, run to prophet, get another prophet who is in agreement with maybe the occult. They do things shortcut to strive to get power because their journey to up there is not easy. In between the shortage of food, in between the water is bitter, in between things are hard and tough. There are times you have to be in the cold. There are times you have to sleep out in the cold. Things will never be favorable. But beloved, when you stand firm and you know that God is leading me to my final destination, you will not be stranded. The end is better. So beloved, this brings us to the end of chapter 15. And we still have lessons to learn because it continues to chapter 16, which we shall see in our next lesson. So beloved, wherever you are, I want you to, to ask God that, Father, I'm here before you. Show me who I am according to the way you see. I want you to reveal to me the way you see me, not the way I see myself, but the way you see me. The areas in my life that I need to attend to that are not allowing the fullness of you to manifest in me, that are not allowing the fullness of you to speak forth in my life, Father, show me. Go before him. You are there. You have never given your life to Christ, but you only follow people online, preachers online. Beloved, this is an opportunity for you to confess Christ as Lord and Savior. Our Lord Jesus said, those who did not deny me before the people, I will stand before them before my Father. I want you to repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you died on the cross for me. With my mouth, I confess that you are Lord over my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving and accepting me. Father, I commit all those that have confessed Christ as Lord and Savior. In boldness, Father, they have confessed and spoken. We command any condition from their foundation that wants to rise up against them because of their confession. We command the conditions to be broken by the power in the blood of Jesus. Let your power and your presence and your mighty works rule and take charge over the affairs of their lives. Anything of theirs that has been held and tied down, we command it to break loose in the mighty name of Jesus. The zeal and the love of you let it continue to be upon them 24-7 in the name of Jesus. I cover, I seal, and I soak them with the blood of Jesus and the fire of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. So the others, I want you to continue to pray. Continue to say, God, reveal to me. Show up me. Bring out that thing that is not allowing the fullness of you. Show me the way you see me. Not the way I see myself, not the way people see me, not the way people speak about me, but you. I want to go by your standard, not the standard of men. I want to go by your standard, not the standard of other people. Father, help me. I come before you. Show yourself unto me. Reveal to me who I am according to your eyes, not what I see myself or what I feel. In Jesus' mighty name we prayed. Beloved, let that be our homework prayer. Get time. Give it about 30 minutes to one hour. Just cry to him like that. Then you go into a state of quiet and you hear what he's saying. Beloved, we pick up when we do that as a routine. You're going to feel a big difference and the Lord will surely manifest himself. My Lord and my God, we want to thank everlasting Father. We bless your name. Daddy, be thou exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. For all that you do and what you shall continue to do, Father, we say thank you. We appreciate your glory, power, and your presence. Let your goodness and mercy rule and take charge in the name of Jesus. Give us the grace to put to action what you're teaching us. That will not only be hearers of your word, that will be doers of your word. And wherever we go, will be the salt, will be your light, that they will see forth your presence 
and everything about you in our lives. Father, we pray, King of glory, that we shall not put the name of Christ under shame and disgrace, that wherever we are, the name of the Lord shall be glorified. Father, take all the glory. Daddy, take all the honor. Father, take all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. God bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord continue to be your lead and your guide. God bless you all.